Yes, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you for tuning in to our second Power to X2, this time the Power to Chemicals tour, of course, about the electrosynthesis of materials and fuels from CO2. And I'm not alone, again, it's good to have my guests here. Martijn, you'll have a special ro role today, but we also have, of course, uh, one of our online guest Erika, we will come back to her later. And we are located today at the Total Energies Research and Technology at Veluwe. Thank you, Moritz, for having us at this beautiful site. And we will talk about this location, of course, um, as well. Martijn, I already mentioned you, of course. Martijn de Graaf, Program Director of Voltagem, Shared Innovation Program. Can you say in a few words what that means? What do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so what we try to do is to, to run the program uh, Voltacam. Huh? One of the activities which we will dis discuss today is electrochemical conversion and specifically CO2, which we will all be uh, talking about. But we actually look broader to electrification of the, of the chemical industry, of which actually this power to chemicals is a very important uh, topic. And that's why we uh, talk about that today. today. Yeah, and uh, to make sure, I, I'm just the host. My name, just the host. My name is Jere. And you are the expert, right? You can make sure that we take yeah. the deep dive into I will this try topic, to ask some questions. Okay, yeah. so what can we expect of today's session? So today, as said, we will look at uh, electrochemical CO2 conversion. This is a topic which is of high interest uh, towards the future. And there's many directions in which you can utilize uh, CO2, one of them being electrochemical. But also in that field, there is multiple directions that you can take, uh, high temperature electrolysis, low temperature electrolysis, but also towards different kinds of products. And depending on the type of company or the type of organization or the type of application, it is determined what you do. That's what we work on within the Voltacam program. Mm -hmm. And that's why we also set up this meeting to show actually together with our partners uh, what it means and w w how to address this topic in a practical way. Yeah, you already mentioned the partners that are going to address these topics, of course, but also the viewers at home are going to give us some input for today, right? They can ask their questions, of course. We have some interactive polls. And you can join us by taking out your mobile devices and uh, type in the address bar power 2 x -tour dot joinlive.tv and I think there's a nice little link somewhere on the page as well so take out your mobile devices go to power2xtour.joinlive.tv and uh, there you can even take a selfie Anka it's a really <laughs> modern thing you can take a selfie and in a few moments time we will even see where everybody is joining us from today but first I want to focus on the topics that we're gonna discuss today Martijn um, <coughs> First, we're going to get to know our guests, of course, and the viewers at home. We're going to talk about high-value products and applications with a short-term business case. We're going to talk about the science of electrochemistry uh, with Professor Sinton, of course, joining us all the way from Canada. It's really early there, so we need to be nice to him. Uh, we're going to talk about the facilities in Delft that we have, where you've been working on, Kai, if I'm not mistaken, and the high-volume products and applications for the long-term business case. So I think many topics to cover in only one and a half hours so let's get straight into the first topic get to know our guests but first let's have a look if the people that are actually joining us from home are already in our interactive tool and we can see that um, if you go to the live tab you can show us where you are located right now we will see a beautiful map of the world um, and you can just uh, give in your selfie on the map so we can see where you are joining us from. Moritz, you're Germany-based, right? I'm based in Belgium here from Felui, but uh, I'm from Germany. You're from Germany yeah. with a French girlfriend. You're like the, you have the total exactly. package. You exactly. have the total <laughs> European <laughs> package. So how is that at home right now with only Germany? Germany went not through, no? So France, also, France <laughs> also not, so you are a Belgium supporter right now. I'm a Belgium supporter, <laughs> yes, yes. I can imagine. Uh, can we go back to the map? Let's see. Yeah, most of us are located in Europe, I see, but I see somebody from Australia joining us, and some from the US, really nice. They must be up really early as well, and somebody is taking a cruise somewhere <laughs> at the Atlantic. <laughs> so uh, that's good to see. Let's get a little bit more into that. Moritz, uh, Moritz Schreiber, of course, project leader of CO2 electroconversion at uh, the Refining and Chemicals branch of Total Energies. 
Uh, you are our host today at this beautiful uh, facility, and you took something with you today to introduce yourself. Can you tell yes. us a bit about the object? Yes. Or, Ori, I'm, I'm very happy that you're here, that you join uh, me, and that also the people uh, from from online, they join us here on our site. You're very welcome. And now I'm going to show you this little object I have. This is an electrochemical um, reactor. And in fact, that was one of the first prototypes uh, developed by the University of Toronto. Um, f four or four years ago already, uh, with which we made the first uh, discoveries, and you see we also ident we which we we uh, identified here. We showed the different constituting elements, and um, you see it's a little bit roughened up <laughs> because I had it, I had to show it a lot to management because uh, electrocatalysis is completely n or is a new topic for Total. Okay, interesting, and I understood that that thing is almost the same one as that thing, but that's <laughs> the one that's working. Uh, and let's talk to Anka Anastapol, Sopol, do I say it correct? Sopol. An <laughs> Anastasopol. Um, and you're project manager electrochemistry at Foltcam and at TNO. Yes. Um, how, how do they link with each other, those two? So let's say if you would go to the lab and you would want to do the reaction that, that Moritz was talking about, you would need something that looks a bit like this. Um, so... Um, yeah, this is one of the first cells that we are using. At, th at this scale, it starts. So everything starts in a small scale, and um, you know, eventually, we want to go and build a site like like Total uh, Energies has here, in which we are going to use CO2 and electricity to make other products. So, because this is the small one, how how big does it need to be in the well end? It needs, uh, we are talking about square meters, okay, right? Okay, so and then and then multiple stacks. So it's it's gonna it's gonna look big, and you have to imagine this also with a plant around it, right? So this is the core, yep. the reactor, but it needs a, a whole support plant around it to make it work. Good to see. Interesting technologies and good to see how it yeah. went from that to that to the square yeah. meters and the big plant of course. We also have Erika Ortning uh, joining us, teaming technology lead for the Volta platform within Avantium and she's online with us. Let's have a check. Erika, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning, good to have you. And I understood that you also brought an item that describes what you're working on or what you like. Well, apparently great minds think because I also thought to uh, uh, bring a small model of uh, one of our gas diffusion electrochemical cells. So because I couldn't go to the office uh, recently, I uh, have to show you a picture. <laughs> it's a 3D printed picture. And, uh, it's actually a model for this uh, larger cell that we use for our, in the, in the, our electrochemistry labs. Good. It, it sounds and this one... Uh, Oh, sorry. There's a, de a small delay in the line, but uh, yeah. yeah. Please uh, go ahead, Jerry. Okay, thanks. Um, well, it, it is linked to the things that we have here. So they all brought the same object in a certain kind of way, Martijn. I also asked you to bring one. What did you bring? Yeah, yeah. so uh, actually I brought this one. Ah, uh, I, 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 know the, I know this one. I showed it before. Yeah. Uh, so in an earlier uh, uh, talk show. And uh, I brought it because uh, it was uh, uh, at home, of course, but uh, because it's all about connecting these things to power and in the end, yeah, what we try to do in the Voltecan program is uh, to, to bring power to the chemical industry through electricity and therefore you need uh, extension cords. Exactly. And uh, maybe the other thing that I also want to say, but it's about sharing power. Ah. And uh, the whole program, uh, Voltecan program, is about sharing knowledge, technology, insights and vision. So that's uh, what I also try to show. You here. have been really thinking long about this. Yeah. I like <laughs> it. Very good. So um, let's go to our people at home once more because we will ask them a second question because we're interested in which sector they do work. So we can, you know, uh, adjust the topic and, and the conversation a bit uh, on them. Uh, so go to the live tab again. Mm -hmm. And when you are at that mobile page, you can also go to the Q&A page, of course, to ask questions to our table guests and uh, to Erica, of course, as well. I see process industry, many people, yes, the policy, knowledge and industry organizations, many people. Is this what you expected, Martijn? Yeah, actually, if you look, uh, you know, the stakeholders that we work together with are from the process industry. They ha need to implement these kind of technologies and mm -hmm. they're looking for new technologies. On the other hand, we have the energy providers, of course, huh, that, that need to power uh, this novel industry. And we have uh, equipment suppliers. Actually, 
it's not so much at the moment, and this is also a challenge, but because you know, equipment suppliers need to have a perspective on where the demands from their customers, eh, which are the process industry, uh, will be and, and, and when it will be. And I think that's something that we are addressing also at the moment in the program. And maybe the last category uh, next to other is, of course, uh, uh, other knowledge institutes and of policy course, organizations. Yeah. And I think we try to work a lot together with them, together with our partners also. That's also what you see in the program today. Because, for example, uh, yeah, at universities, m many, many novel ideas are being developed. And, well, w I think what we try to do here, and that's what you see in the different objects, is to bring that further and in the end the the real object so to say which is not on the table should be this big chemical plant a little bit like it's there yep. on the back side but then using novel technology and that's still uh, still a way to go and that's also the link of Voltcam to today's topic i think right to bring yeah. all this knowledge together and if i'm not mistaken we even have a small video about that yeah let's have a look over the next 20 years, the chemical industry will have to reduce its CO2 emissions and need to transform its processes in order to produce chemicals and fuels in a sustainable way. Renewable electricity will become more abundantly available and CO2 emissions will be regulated. We at Voltichem believe that our innovations in decarbonization of energy and recarbonization of raw materials will accelerate the application of new electrochemical processes in the chemical industry within the coming decades. But these new processes need to be scaled up to become as competitive as the current ones. And that is Voltichem's strength. With our Power to Chemicals program, we focus on the development and integration of new electrochemical reactors within existing chemical production facilities. Due to mild production conditions, electrochemical processes are well suited for the production of highly functional chemicals. They are the building blocks for daily life products such as high-performance plastics, care products, food ingredients, and pharmaceuticals. Next to that, we are working on technologies that enable the use of biomass or CO2 for the production of base chemicals such as plastics, fertilizers, and fuels. Our innovations focus on reducing investment in production costs and creating a competitive future-proof sustainable value chain. To accelerate commercial adoption, we collaborate with knowledge institutions, technology suppliers, equipment manufacturers, licensors, and the chemical industries around the world. If you have the ambition to contribute to a more sustainable chemical industry, please contact us via Volticchem.com. Theo, Martijn, you also had a say in who should join our table. Why did you pick uh, uh, Moritz, Anka and Erika? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So we work uh, on, on several technologies. Yeah. For this, uh, this show, we said we want to focus on uh, electrochemical conversion. And I think, uh, well, one, one of the most important future electrochemical conversions is the conversion of CO2. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, the problem is that is also an issue. That's the case, the business case. It should be competitive with other type of conversion routes, both electrochemical and non-electrochemical. And it's still quite a long way to go. So what we've seen in the last couple of years in the, in the, in the collaborations that we have is that you actually see two sides. Uh, one side being focusing on this long-term goal, really mm -hmm. going for production of commodity chemicals or large scale, uh, predominantly being done by larger companies that are also able to do that, uh, to, 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 uh, to work on that. Uh, and the other side is the, uh, let's say, the, the shorter timeline where you want to produce those products that have already an intrinsic value by themselves and not per se uh, compete with the existing uh, molecules uh, that are out there. These two sides are there and we said actually, well in this meeting we want to show both sides from the different partners that we have mm -hmm. and really show that there's not the one or the other, but that both are, are valuable and both are important to achieve that end goal, which is conversion of CO2 to in, uh, into valuable products. And I see Moritz nodding, you, you totally agree? With Martijn? Yes, I, gr I agree. I think uh, the CO2, this is a building block in for the future that can become a, bil a building block not only for the high volume chemicals, but also for the volu high, uh, low volume chemicals like uh, other building blocks we use already today, uh, typically. And uh, just uh, for me, how, lo how long does it take to go from that 
to that to <laughs> the big plan. <laughs> I see you laughing, Anka, because you're saying, uh, Martijn, it, yeah. it's sometimes a long way to go. It's, it's uh, lots of research, lots of product development, I can imagine. H how long does something like that take? Well, to develop technology, you have to have the right partners to do it uh, with. Um how, do, how do you get the right partners? Um, well, um, by, uh, by talking to each other and sharing the, the, common, the common problems and, and trying to, uh, to find common solutions and value from, from these solutions, creating value from the different partners on the, on the value chain. Um, and um, yeah, this, this is the, the crucial thing. Um, if, if you do not have the right partners, uh, it's, it's no sense uh, in scaling it up and, and doing it further. Um, let me give you an example. For instance, we are, we are working a lot on, on making this reaction work, right, in mm -hmm. these type of cells, uh, together with our partners from, from, from Total Energies, from uh, you, you'll see other, uh, other uh, parties uh, today that are going to talk about the same thing. Um, if we do not have the materials at the right scale, uh, you know, material producers or equipment producers to, to produce this, uh, these installations, um, well, the development will also be um, uh, slower. Yeah, maybe to add to that, so, so uh, we already know that in, uh, let's say, four to five years, we have to go again to a bigger scale. But if there's yeah. no, like we saw, the equipment suppliers or providers of technologies or companies that are able to run these kind of plants, you really have a big problem. So it's not that you can easily uh, uh, do this. You have to really collaborate with different partners, both from academia, but also from the industry competing actually with a technology that is already out there and i think in that playing field uh, that's where we also see with the with the Voltacam activities you really uh, yeah have to ha have the same view and vision and then start making steps uh, uh, in projects mm -hmm. together and uh, and then you go in the right direction but it will take uh, for the large scale uh, uh, still long a long <coughs> uh, long time before you get to that scale that you see behind you mm -hmm. and um, at that point I would also like to add something we know for we have a for for, for uh, upscaling electrochemical processes we have already uh, the case of, of hydrogen and we can learn a lot in fact how how that worked what yeah. were the the what went well what didn't went so well and uh, in experience Scaling up by a factor of 10, the hydrogen, uh, like the units, takes about four <coughs> years. So we could imagine f going, starting from, from this, this four yeah. years ago, so now we're already bigger somehow, um, to have a 10 megawatt unit around 2035 if everything works well. And um, by comparison, uh, for example, a ref refinery, the throughput in products of a refinery would be comparable to 10 gigawatt. So it's a factor, even to 2035, we would be a factor of 1,000 yeah. away from what the refinery produces today. So, so for me, it sounds like a really long term, but I can imagine that for you guys, it's also 2035 is like tomorrow almost, right? It's, it's, it's quick, and we have this challenge of, of becoming neutral in it no, yeah, but this, is this is the point eh? so in 2030 we have already uh, in europe the target for uh, 55 percent now exactly the co2 reduction uh and and in in uh, 2050 we have to be at 95 percent exactly. so if you look at that timeline it is actually you showed it also back in the program how it's built up you see indeed hydrogen if we if we can implement the first larger scale hydrogen before 2030, then we can utilize all the knowledge that we gain from operating these plants, etc. We can utilize later also for this electrochemical conversion. And maybe then it can be going faster because these companies that are now active in the hydrogen domain can then, in the core of the technology, put that Jump in these on the kind train of electrolyzers. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, we also have some short-term business <coughs> cases, and Avantium and DSM are both working on technologies for high-value applications, and let's take a deep dive into them with our first topic of today, the high-value products. <laughs> Yes, and I think this is a great moment to get Erika back in the call from Avantium because she is working on such a business case. And Erika, can you maybe explain a little bit on what technology you are developing right now? Yes, so uh, I recognize a lot of the things that were just uh, being said. So we are working on a CO2 conversion 
um, towards carboxylic acids, uh, where formic acid and carbon monoxide are building blocks towards other molecules. And in this way, um, focusing on the carboxylic acid market, so using a market that's slightly smaller, uh, but also um, it has, let's say, a slightly larger profit margins. We hope to be able to commercialize earlier instead of, let's say, in uh, 2030 uh, and, and, and really focus on the next couple of years. And what, what are currently your biggest challenges? I think one of the biggest challenges is uh, I recognize what, what Moritz is saying, like technology can develop super quickly, but you need the right partners willing to have that longer term vision. So having uh, a business case is very difficult when competing with fossil products. So you need certain policies that need to be adjusted. You need green energy. You need to have a really good footprint. Your carbon footprint is your selling point. Um, and what we notice is that when you go to bigger and bigger scale, you need larger and larger investments. And bridging this period is quite challenging. I can imagine, Martijn, if, if we uh, listen to, to Erika's story, that Voltechem can help here, right? W with connecting to the right partners. Yeah, in a certain way. So what we try to do is we, 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 have, we have both the technology side, but actually we also, in the last five years, have built up a whole network network of collaboration partners mm -hmm. huh? uh, in one project or the other and 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 but still uh, this this next step that was just being said i think takes quite some investments and then uh, the uh, it starts counting that you have to have a business case in order to 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 get that investment mm -hmm. and then you have to be able to compare your technology in a positive way to uh, to the existing uh, Case. What you sh but I think positive is what you see now more and more is the legislation coming up eh, from Europe uh, where you see uh, that also a lot of companies start calculating with, for example, certain CO2 prices. Mm -hmm. So that gives a positive uh, uh, swing to the, to the business cases. And the other side is that also the public itself is more and more demanding for sustainable products. Of course, still you then need investors that believe in that and think okay i i'm going to invest my money in this uh first demonstration pilot demonstration or further unit so that you can take it further so so yeah we we try to help there and we try to utilize our network uh but the more uh, yeah let's say regulation and and push and pull that comes from the market the easier it will become for uh, companies like uh, like avantium to make next steps yeah in for the people at home watching us, make sure to ask all your questions via the Q&A tab. And we have another example of, of technology being, dissolved, uh, being developed, of course, uh, by uh, Wouter van Winde, who is of, uh, of uh, DSM. And he sent in a little video. He's the principal scientist of fermentation at DSM, the biotechnology center. And he's working with you, right? Yes, and that's a flagship project, if I'm not mistaken. Indeed. What's a flagship project? <laughs> so we are we are working in a in a project with uh, with DSM um, in order to um, to utilize the CO2 to capture the CO2 yeah. to utilize it in electrolysis to make formic acid and then to feed the formic acid to a ferment uh, to a fermenter and this fermenter is capable of making higher value products. It is a specific um, uh, a specific technology yeah. that can help us, let's say, to uh, to show the potential of CO2 electrochemical reduction. Uh, and also the economic potential uh, of, of uh, this technology. Okay, cool. Let's have a look at Wouter. Good morning. My name is Wouter van Winden, and I'm a principal scientist for fermentation at the DSM Biotechnology Center in Delft, the Netherlands. Many of you will know DSM as a big multinational company, which is active in the fields of nutrition, both for animals and humans, and materials, engineering materials, as well as protective materials. Now, DSM, as many other big companies, has committed to very steep reduction of its greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, as well as completely climate neutral production of all of its products by 2050. Now, we know that uh, the obvious solutions of saving energy, as well as using renewable energy, is not sufficient to reach those goals. We have concluded that we will need some radical solutions and radical innovations in our production processes. 
In our production plants, we use many fermentation processes. Fermentation processes use sugar as one of the main raw materials, and sugars are renewable, so that's already more sustainable than using fossil resources. However, during the production of sugar, during the operation of fermentation, as well as during the downstream processing, we still emit quite some greenhouse gases. So most of our fermentative products are still not climate neutral. The microbes in our fermenters, they use part of the sugar as a carbon source and part of it as an energy source. And the part that is used as an energy source is combusted to CO2 by the microorganisms. Now it's that part of the sugar that we would like to replace by renewable electricity. And we need a carrier, an electron carrier, that can donate those electrons to the microbial metabolism. Now one such carrier is formic acid. Together with external parties, including TNO, we are now developing the technologies to capture the CO2 from the fermentation off gas, to reduce it electrochemically to formic acid, and to recycle that formic acid back to the fermenter as an energy source. And this reduces the use of sugar in our process, as well as the emission of greenhouse gases. Now, the key challenge is to make the capture and reduction of CO2 techno-economically feasible which means that we have to produce formic acid of a sufficiently high concentration and without toxic byproducts that would harm or kill our microbes in the process. Yes, and uh, Wouter gave us a poll, or at least the people at home a poll, which is what's the key cha challenge to make integrated capture and conversion of CO2 techno-economically viable? You can answer that, but first I want to know, of course, Anka, because he's working on a similar topic as, as you're working on, similar project. How does this compare to you, the story of Wouter? Well, um, in the story of Wouter, the first part, the, the capture of uh, carbon dioxide and the um, uh, the conversion, uh, the electrochemical conversion, is a part that, that we are contributing to that project and we're making formic acid as a product for their fermentation. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, we are, um, uh, we are looking to make the, the entire chain uh, sustainable in the sense that we are using CO2 that comes also from a biogenic source, from, um, uh, from a fermentation process, to be again integrated and used in the electrolysis. Um, there are technical challenges um, mm -hmm. uh, related to, uh, to this. There are material challenges. Um, and uh, we are now uh, busy demonstrating this in our laboratories in Delft that uh, you're going to see uh, a we'll bit later. See that later. Okay. Yeah, you're, okay. you're teasing them already yeah, with okay. those uh, things, of course. And how, how does this story, your story, and, and the story of Wouter fit in the stepping stone approach towards 2050? Well, uh, as, as Martin was saying, there are, there are two approaches, right? You, you're, you're looking at, uh, at uh, large-scale uh, commodity chemicals or at, at lo uh, smaller scale uh, but higher value chemicals, right? And you have to start somewhere. And the, let's say the first business cases will be in these in this higher value products. Um, and the reason for this is that CO2, it's not the natural it's not cons naturally considered as a resource. It is, it is typically a waste product mm -hmm. uh, and, and a, a pest that we are trying to, to get rid of, yep. right? Um, we are trying to make value of it. And, and the best way to show, uh, to, to demonstrate a new technology is to actually make a product that has a, a higher price um, and, and further to scale it up to, to really high, high volume chemicals like, like Total is making. Yeah, I think Erika, of course, also has a saying in this because she has the Avancium thing she has been, uh, she's working on and developing. Um, Erika, what did you think of the story of Wouter? Uh, I like it a lot, actually. Uh, I think uh, CO2 to formic acid is one step. It's uh, relatively easy. And I think it shows the potential of formic acid as a product. So here they use it in a very creative way as an energy carrier. But uh, I think formic acid can also be used as a feedstock for microbial conversions. And this is also something we are looking into. So I think it's a really nice example of also the versatility of a, mo a simple molecule such as formic acid and what it can do to, to replace, uh, I think, several fossil products in the future. What do you think of his poll? Because he asked, when is the right time? Uh, well, no, what's the key challenge to make integrated capture and conversion of CO2 techno-economically viable? Wh what, what would you pick? Did you see the options? Should I repeat them for you? 
I will repeat them. That's maybe. Can so is it <laughs> finding the right target molecule that has intrinsic value? Is it identifying the right solvent to integrate capture with conversion? Is it having an international CO2 pricing mechanism in place? Or D, cross the business and language barrier of different sectors? Or E, other. <laughs> that can be anything. <laughs> what would you say that yeah, is the answer to this question? I, th I think having the most efficient business case is uh, the most important thing and uh, targeting the right molecules, but also having the creativity to think of new ways to do something most efficiently is, yeah, is what I would say. Okay. So it's, it's maybe a combination of A and D. <laughs> A and D, you, you just say all of the above. <laughs> I think it is, uh, that's always <laughs> the difficulty when you have to choose, huh? but uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I think uh, what I saw actually uh, is, is a lot about the regulation, huh? yeah. but I think it's, it's, it's highly dependent on the case that you choose, because I think what Erika also just said, uh, 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 choosing a molecule that has high intrinsic value and combined with creativity, what we just saw in the example, huh, using that well, so let's say intermediate molecule in a fermentation process, which creates really the value. I think that that creativity is also very important. Yeah. And if we, Moritz, if I uh, can come to you, they're talking about these new technologies. What, what, from your point of view, from your side, which is a little bit different, of course, what do you see as their challenges or bottlenecks that they have? Um, I think it's already very important that this work is done. If, uh, even though Total is um, working on, on, on high uh, volume markets and this is more on, on smaller volumes, on, on, on fine chemicals, but this is really the stepping stone approach what we need to see the first business cases uh, coming up in fact for, C for electrochemical CO2 utilization and then it's a little bit like with the batteries, the batteries we started to have in our laptops, lithium mm -hmm. ion and batteries and now this the, the money which was made with that fueled the development of the battery batteries we can now put in our in, in our cars and I think this is very very important uh, to do this in terms of the um, of the challenge I think also we have the challenge that we have to um, boost these technologies using CO2 by some CO2 pricing mechanism in the future to be uh, competitive. Is that something you agree with? The, the CO2 price? Yeah, I think, I, I think if you come, you know, if, if you're a user of a chemical or, or of a product, you normally compare with the price, mm -hmm. right? Also, if you're uh, in the supermarket, you look like, which one do I uh, take? Oh, this is the cheaper one. So if you don't have a mechanism that favors, uh, let's say, sustainably produced products over, uh, in this case, fossil produced products, uh, then it's very difficult. And I think that's not only the case for, for uh, uh, electrification or electrochemical uh, conversion. It's, the, it's all, all over the place. And I, I think uh, it's very important that, that, that you know, for an ind individual person or company, it's, it's difficult because you're in a competitive landscape. So regulators should at some point uh, give the direction, even if they say, and it's happening, huh? So even if they say, well, in 2030 it's like this, and 2040 this, yeah. it's yeah. like this, then you can already calculate back, okay, now we have to start our research, or now we have to uh, scale up. And also investors know, okay, this is technologies that will indeed uh, generate revenues. Yeah. So, so this, this landscape should indeed <coughs> be defined, and we see it happening in Europe, and that's also what we see in our program actually, that more and more now organizations, companies uh, are, are, are looking at these topics and trying to find out which ones are uh, in what time frame uh, going to make, uh, make impact. Yeah. I see that we have some questions that came in from the audience. Let's have a look <coughs> and let's see if Erika or maybe Moritz or Anka can answer these questions. Uh, can I get them one size bigger? Yes. Mm -hmm. What's the role and influence of rare earth material in the business cases with regards to developing mm -hmm. building and upscaling the device in this processor, also with regards to future cost fitting? Is the question for you, Anka, or is it for Erika? What do you think? Um, Maybe I for think both, right? We, we can both address we can it. You can <laughs> both address it. <laughs> Let's start with Erika, because she started this topic, of course, mm -hmm. with the short-term business case. Erika. Can you please repeat the question? I'm yes. sorry, it was very long. <laughs> of course, it was a tough question. Can I see it one more time, guys? 
What is the role and influence of rare earth material in the business case with regards to developing, building and upscaling the device in this processor, also with regards to future cost fitting? Yeah, it's a question, I think, uh, because in electrochemistry you use uh, yeah, quite a lot of uh, electricity, but also quite a lot of metal. And um, I think it's not a determining factor in the future cost fitting, but I do think you have to take into account that you want to work as, yeah, as little with rare earth metals as you can, because like oil, I mean, they can run out. And uh, I think it's important to have a process that, uh, yeah, if, if you build a future process, you need to also look to what the future circumstances are. And I think using a lot of rare earth metals is not one of the things you should be doing. So this is something we, uh, look towards. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if this answers the question. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's a super uh, influential factor in the business case currently. I think the presence of earth metals in our processes is it's for historical reasons because when, when we started a few years back at looking at electrolysis of CO2, our model for electrolysis was water electrolysis where rare earth metals are, are being used mm -hmm. uh, as and, and expensive metals are being used in the um, as, as catalyst, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and and still we are, uh, let's say, uh, when you do this reaction, you have one of the react, uh, half of the reaction uses the rare earth metals and produces oxygen. The other half, it uh, uses CO2 and produces formic acid or carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think uh, it's, it's a spot on question to, to trigger us to think of clever ways of replacing the oxygen production in our process you know, if it's not needed, we can uh, we can replace it with a different counter reaction that will not require this, you know, expensive and uh, you know uh, materials that uh, that, that uh, run require out. Yeah. Uh, run out or require intensive mining or yeah. you know other um, you know high environmental impacts. So and are you already working on that? And we are working on strategies to do this. So, for instance, we have showcases uh, coupling with uh, let's say chlorine production. Mm -hmm. and production, it's an electrochemical process. Uh, what we have uh, done, we have uh, made a, a showcase together with our partners, um, Avancium in this case, mm -hmm. so Erika will, will know very well about it, uh, in which we made uh, from CO2, CO, and then uh, and at, at the anode we, we made uh, chlorine, uh, and together, uh, you know, we could make phosgene and, and uh, create the precursors towards, uh, towards polymers. So. It's a good question, it's spot on, it is. and we are thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, maybe yes. uh, one last remark from another program line in the Voltecam program in, 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 uh, in hydrogen. Huh? We looked at this uh, uh, because that is already going into large scale before 2030. And there indeed you see that the metals that you use, huh, maybe not ra rare earth, but, but scarce materials like iridium, for example, in permaelectrolysis, they're really playing a role. Maybe not now because it's still small, but if you start building these big plants, you need a lot and not only in electrolysis, but also in other uh, energy technologies, eh, like batteries and those mm -hmm. kind of things, mm -hmm. you need these metals. So w we should, it's not a problem now, but it's if you scale this up to these sizes that were just mentioned, then it's a big problem. And we should now already work on other ma using other materials to, m to, to do the same things. I think this rounds up nicely the first block on uh, high value products and application for a short term business case. But before we close it, let's get one more time back to Erica, because maybe there's something we forgot to address that she really wants to tell us. Erica. Um, not specifically. I really liked the discussion, actually. I think a lot of relevant points came up. Good. Then. Thanks for joining us in this blog, and I'm sure that you will stay online with us so we can get your input on other topics as well today. Then this was the part where we talked about high-value products and applications, and that means that we go to our next part, and we're joined by Professor Dave Sinton all the way from Canada, where it is still really early, and we're going to talk about the electrochemistry science. <laughs> Yes, and joining us live from the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at the University of Toronto is Professor Sinton. Professor Sinton, good morning. Good morning. Good I've morning. I've enjoyed it's the good discussion so far. 
it's, uh, it's uh, good to see you up so early. Thank you uh, for joining us. You're a renowned professor, of course. Um, we would love to hear what you have to tell us on electrochemistry, of course. So the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be speaking about CO2 to, to ethylene uh, today. And, and, and this work is, is with my group and in collaboration with Ted Sargent's group at University of Toronto and, and with, uh, with Moritz as well, who's joining at the table and, uh, and collaborators at, at Total Energies. Next slide, please. All right, so like many um, in, the, in the session today, you know, our vision is for, for electrochemicals and electrofuels. Um, there's a few routes that, that one can imagine. Uh, the one I'll be speaking to today is, is on the left-hand side. So that's where we take CO2 and we convert it to chemicals and fuels. And, and as Maurice mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we're really targeting the, the, the large market um, chemicals uh, with this project, and that's, that's ethylene in particular. But, but also, you know, a lot of the work we're doing is, is relevant to the other side of the, of, of the, the plot here, which is with his fuels um, and, and uh, ethanol in particular. Great. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a little uh, menu of our history um, in this area. We started with, um, with looking at nanocatalysts and, 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 and how we could, we could design those, structure those, to get higher activities, and this was this was about five years ago. And you can see the arc from the left to the right, um, where we're moving from nanocatalysts to, to more to electrodes. And 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 the electrodes, of course, the challenge is getting all the reactants to where you need them, getting the electrons to where you need them, having the right conditions and electrolyte contact, and then be able to get the products out of there. Right. So that's that's the challenge. And and so that center example is is an example of an electrode, an integrated electrode that achieves that. Now on the far right, this is a bit more of our more recent work where we're looking at, at systems. So how do we take this we, from the nanocatalyst on the far left all the way over to, to integrated systems that, 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 uh, that take in CO2 and produce high market chemicals. And we've focused, as I mentioned, mostly on C2, ethylene and ethanol. Next slide, please. With the help of, of Total Energies, we really have learned to take a, a, a full spectrum uh, view of the electrolyzer. So look upstream and downstream. Um, on the input side, of course, you want to eat the cheapest stuff possible. Um, and and uh, inside the cell, you need to be productive. Uh, you need to be efficient and stable. And then there's gains that need to be made in all those areas. And then on the output side, you want to produce the, the most valuable um, <clears throat> product and in a state that, that, is, that, is, that is sellable to a large market. Um, I'm going to show a few examples in the next few slides uh, that get to the question of, of this cell. So what's the productivity? How can we increase productivity? And then how can, we, how can we increase efficiency, overall efficiency and stability? Again, thinking about this full picture um, from, from CO2. To, uh, to something somebody wants to buy. Next slide. So this is an example of, of us increasing the productivity. And as all here are very familiar, um, uh, electrochemical reactions take place at interfaces. And that's why, you know, um, <clears throat> electrical chemical cells are, are, are sets of, of planes, of, of uh, of planar cells in a, in a stack, um, and and we asked, could we could we somehow extend that reaction interface, go beyond just the linear um, planar area, and 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 get all those conditions that we need for the reaction um, at at um, at more uh, over more catalyst area. So the answer is to this uh, challenge was was extending the reactive area, and we did that with a. With a, with a metal ionomer hybrid catalyst. You can see on the right-hand side that the, the vision there that the, the CO2 reactant can be carried into the electrolyte along the catalyst. And one of the reasons why that's so important in, in these systems is because of CO2 loss. If we just let CO2 into the electrolyte, um, uh, diffusing into the electrolyte, it's quickly converted to carbon and bar carbides. 
So, so to avoid that loss and protect it and, and, and allow CO2 to move along the interface, this was one solution. And I'm going to come back to the challenge of carbonates in a second. Next slide, please. So this is a nice techno-economic analysis that was recently published. And you can imagine all of the, the different costs that go into electrolyzer systems. And, and, and then what that, what that turns out, uh, uh, what the result is in terms of the cost of ethylene produced. And I'll, I'll draw your attention to the MEA cell because those are the most uh, flattering, shortest bars there in terms of cost. And the, you can see the lab data <coughs> um, is, still, is still far from, from, uh, from a reference price of, of $1,000 a ton for the MEA case, but the optimistic MEA case shows us that we can get close to $1,000 a ton, but you can see that that, <coughs> that purple bar above the line in the MEA optimistic case that still, even an optimistic scenario, still keeps us above um, the competitive price for ethylene is the anode separation cost. And, and that comes about because CO2 is crossing over. And I mentioned in the last slide that, that we have this competition, CO2 converting to carbonate, and then, and, then, and then carbonate going to the anode side in these cells, and then it gets released as CO2. So in some sense, well, that's not so bad. You still, you still have CO2 there. You can recapture it. You can, but it's very costly because it's mixed with oxygen. So that's the challenge. We're losing reactants. So that, that's that bar that, that uh, motivates the next few slides. Go ahead. So we took the approach that, you know, could we, could we have a carbon, could we have a, a tandem system where we convert the CO2 to CO in an established solid oxide electrochemical cell? Um, and that is that doesn't suffer from this carbonate issue and then to work on the other half which is the CO2 ethylene so this is a common chemical engineering kind of approach right break the process into individual processes processes that you can do well and and the first step is on this slide that's CO2 to CO and and uh, with a commercial system we're able to achieve um, good stability and, and and efficiency next slide now, where we focused was, was in the CO to, to ethylene uh, in an MEA cell. This is what needed the most help in the study. And, and here, through a combination of some of the methods I showed earlier, extending the reaction interface and controlling that, um, those reaction conditions, reducing cell voltages, we were able to get to um, a very efficient second step here that doesn't suffer from carbonate formation. So that purple bar I was complaining about, um, isn't an issue here. And as a result, overall process efficiency, we get to around um, 140 gigajoules per ton ethylene, which is, which is half of the energy density of the direct route. Next slide, please. This is the last example I'm going to show, and it's, <clears throat> and it's one that's, that's um, I think, apropos of, of the discussions this morning, and that's, and that's around scaling. To what extent can we take these small scale systems <clears throat> and build uh, larger scale systems and, and starting with pilot plants? So this is our pilot plant that we built in, in partnership with, with uh, Total Energies and, and University of Toronto. And this is, this is a large CO2 electrolyzer uh, in the context of what's available in the field. Um, to my knowledge, it's the largest C2 <clears throat> producing CO2 electrolyzer in the world. Um, it's 40,000 centimeters squared, so to give you a sense of scale, you know, typical cells that academic labs like myself work with are kind of, you know, five centimeters squared, ten, or sometimes we do a hundred. Um, <clears throat> so this is this is large. This is 40,000, and we have this running 24 hours a day for several months, and as a result, learned a tremendous amount. And and I'm happy to uh, to touch on this, and Maritz can also touch on some of the lessons here. Um, just a few of them. The, the, the MEA reactor is compatible with scale. It was, it was possible to do this with that format. Um, there's no substitute for testing at scale. Pilot plants are important. Uh, and lastly, we still have lots of work to do upstream and in the stack and downstream. Next slide, please. And so um, uh, a question that, that we pose to ourselves is how can we have it all? We need to take these cheap CO2 
uh, inputs. And, and to do that, we need to work with um, either capture fluids directly or with, um, or with flue, grass, flue, flue gas streams. And, and, and then convert those to the high value uh, products. And, and, and there's lots of approaches. And in my question I posed uh, to the, to the Volticam audience here and the table <clears throat> gets to some of those. Can we, can we, can we work with um, alternative anode products? We're doing OER on the other side, on the anode side. And <clears throat> we're not selling those products. Can we, can we do better there? Do a reaction that produces a sellable product or reduces the voltage? Um, the other approaches I mentioned that the, the tandem cascade approach, can we think along those lines? Uh, and then can we improve the, the, um, the full cell voltage, reduce, um, reduce voltages and also uh, improve stability? So all of those challenges ahead. Um, one last uh, thing on, on these points, you know, with, with Total Energies, we really view this as, as a, as a, as a multi-sector challenge. And, and are really open to thinking and, and, and working with other companies, especially those that have specific expertise um, around um, uh, manufacturing and, and electrodes um, and producing electrodes at scale and memory materials and all of these aspects that go into the cell. Um, and with that, I'll thank you. So that's me on the left and, and Ted Sargent's group with which we collaborate and, and Total Energies and, and especially thank you to you for your um, interest today thank you well uh, uh, a lot of thanks to you of course for joining us very early from uh, canada thanks for your contribution i saw martin taking notes as never before he has been written all around so we'll come back to that later but i first want to hear from moritz of course because you have been collaborating with professor sinton uh, how does this match your industrial view point of view on this topic I think we do really great work together uh, with the group in Toronto, but also with other partners, for example, from TNO, um, Collège de France at Stanford, NNL. Um, and what we need as Total, we need to understand this technology, and then we need to assess and evaluate this technology. If this can, at the large scale, work, because now we are here. Mm -hmm. And we already have to take into, these con into consideration all these, uh, yeah, all these questions. Does it work at large scale? And with the University of Toronto, we have a great partner, in fact, to addressing this. Uh, we have a very close collaboration um, to also do already some scale-up work and to assess what, what are the, the problems or the challenges for the next scaling. But you also see, I can imagine that you sometimes experience some friction, right, where science wants to do something different than the industry. Uh, 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 do you have examples of that as well? I think both is needed and um, we just have to bring this together and we have to manage this in the right way because you need to have also this, this you, have, you need to have the freedom of science to of explore course. new ideas. For example, uh, there was a new article uh, recently on, on using uh, acidic uh, pH cells in to avoid, in fact, the, the, this carbonate crossover within one cell. And this, uh, as an industrial, we not, would not have thought of it. This is then our partners in, in academia who just explore this, and therefore this is, is needed. Of course, for industry, we then always have to pull out and have to challenge, in fact, the academics. Uh, is this really working on a large scale? We have to ask yeah. the right questions. Yeah. yeah, so you have to r ask the right questions. And talking about right questions, Professor Sinton asked us the question as well. So we have a poll for you guys at home but also of course for you sitting here uh, his question was what are the most promising new directions for carbon dioxide to ethylene and these are the five options develop new catalysts with higher selectivity develop new systems that avoid reactant or product crossover pursue the cascade approach co2 to co followed by co to ethylene or develop systems and catalysts that are robust to flu gas inputs or other what did you all write down, Martijn? Then the people uh, at home can answer the question, but what did you yeah. all write down? You were taking so many notes. No, yeah, actually, I was thinking, because we had it earlier, we had a discussion about creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I really like about this, this, this uh, uh, talk uh, and about the work uh, that's being done 
is that it shows the creativity. And that's also, I think, what couples into the question how to collaborate with, uh, with, the, with the universities. Eh? Uh, I think the tandem approach that was just shown, which actually is about coupling solid oxide electrolysis, which is a high temperature electrochemical process, which is actually a different community what you see than the low temperature electrolysis, which is the MEA system, that, that, that this is combined, this is creativity, eh? really trying to combine best of both worlds and show that it works. Uh, th the other topic, uh, 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 this is the tandem approach. The mm -hmm. other topic is this coupling of products that was just now also shortly uh, discussed, but which Al Anka also talked about. I think these kind of things we need because um, only one technology will not will not make it or will not work. Uh, you have to look at the different technologies, even the combination that we just saw uh, with Wouter, mm -hmm. with the bio-based, I think uh, that's really great. And uh, so that's why I was writing a lot down. I think also what was being mentioned is this upstream and downstream mm. integration. Huh? I, I think that's uh, that's also great that uh, yeah. that the University of Toronto and uh, specifically Professor and Sinton is working on that. And yeah. that might be the way to have it all. Yeah. Is it he posed the question how to have it all, but mm. these all, but I see a little bit, you're not really sure about no, that I, yet. I think you have to, to pursue different routes. Take and, yeah. and, and, and try them out, and then some of them uh, we take it further. And, and I, I don't know, we have to see whether we can have it all, uh, uh, whether we can uh, have the cake and eat it, uh, yep. we have to see. But uh, I, I think <coughs> it's, uh, it's a good approach. It's different routes to yeah. see if we can have yeah. it all. And I have to tell you, Gere, whenever we have uh, a new article from, from Professor uh, Sinton's uh, group, we pass it around like warm bread. In really? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> you have a party at the office, it's a new article. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, um, it's because at least uh, they give us uh, perspectives that, uh, that we would not have, right? So they look very at very intimately into the materials and how they work and they try to solve it. So uh, their work made us understand how, th how, how electrodes work, what are the processes that, that are actually dominating. So then they help us make the right decisions also when we scale up, right? So, so it's always a little surprise that you get in the articles uh, or new it insights. Is, you know, it's just exactly, it just it gives you that spark to generate new ideas and then to, uh, to think in new ways how to how to make your process uh, um, better. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Let's also have a look at the poll and Anka maybe you can reflect upon that. Um, what do you think are the most promising new directions for CO2? Well, I think everything, everything that is <laughs> that is mentioned here is important but I would choose other because <laughs> Okay, I which one would you choose? What <laughs> I would what I would like to say it's it's important to think of uh, of of the system, right? Mm -hmm. So um, where is my CO2 coming from? Um, what is the product that I'm going to make? And then um, the path to, to get from CO2 to your product is going to be different, right? Uh, and uh, I think because of this, Im important is to, to integrate different technologies on this path. Because in this way, uh, we, we can actually make it more economic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm saying not only integrate it to, to already existing big plants, but also these new emerging technologies. Let's develop them together. Like uh, here it was a specific example of SOEC with, um, with uh, low temperature electrolysis, yeah. right? Uh, this cascade. And that's, you know, and that's a very clever way of thinking about it. Um, you can also think of, okay, uh, where is my CO2 coming from? How am I going to capture it? How do I integrate it? How do I use that into an electrolyzer? Is my electrolyzer going to look the same as if I don't do that process? Mm -hmm. uh, and you see, when you ask these questions, there are, they are new solutions, and that's uh, that, that, uh, that make more sense than if you would just go and, and develop each technology uh, individually, uh, and, and then you hope that f by some miracle they're going to work together. Yeah, right? so the, the, the early integration of the technologies makes it work. Let's yeah. uh, close this section of, um, uh, of the science part uh, with a question to Erika, because uh, she's still here as well. Erika, I'm wondering, what do you take away of the presentation of Professor Sinton? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, I played him also on the, the nice admit that I'm also impressed because ethylene is, in my opinion, a molecule that is very convenient to make from oil and is extremely challenging to make from CO2 because you have to deoxygenate the molecule fully. So I understand why uh, 
there's still a lot of interest in it. But uh, yeah, I, th I think it's just a really, really challenging product. So uh, yeah, I, I thought the results were quite nice. Okay, we get the gist. There was some little delay in your response, but I think we get the gist that uh, you took home. The, 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 maybe you can summarize it for me one more time because yeah. it was all about molecules. I'm not in the molecules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th <laughs> so that, that's right. I, I think so. Looking for ethylene, it's of course a big molecule. We yeah. make our plastic bags out of it, etc. So, so that's important. But but uh, uh, also, I think that's how we at least also look at it from from the Voltacam side. Uh, a challenge is in uh, in 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 the oxygen. And maybe Anke will say something about that later. Uh, so, so yeah, I think uh, it's uh, it, it was uh, a great uh, presentation. That's also what Erika said. I think uh, Anke will yeah. tell us shortly yeah. about it because we're gonna round up this part on the electrochemistry science, <coughs> and we're gonna have a look at the Voltagem facilities in Delft. <laughs> Yes, and this is definitely not Delft, is because this is the location where we are right now. But Anka, you've been using the facilities in Delft, right? Yes. And you did so for several projects. And yes. I think before we're going to talk about those projects, we're going to first have a look at the facilities. All right. So, has developed a wide portfolio of electrochemical reactions, ranging from electro-organic synthesis from biomass to electrochemical reduction of CO2. Here in the Electrochemistry Lab in Delft, together with partners from industry and academia, researchers and engineers work on cutting-edge innovations in electrosynthesis of high-value products from renewable feedstock with one ultimate aim, accelerating industrial electrification to create a sustainable chemical industry. So the main focus is uh, electrochemical engineering and process intensification. And for this purpose, we have uh, in our lab facilities electrochemical reactors ranging from few centimeters square up to several hundred centimeters square uh, for ambient as well as high pressure electrolysis. For instance, behind me, we have an installation with 1,000 centimeters square electrochemical reactor, which we are using uh, together with our partners in bilateral projects for scaling up electrochemical production methods. R&D projects conducted at the lab in Delft range from short-term bilateral research projects to long-term programmatic innovation. Each project is approached in a similar way. After identification of the research challenges, together with partners and clients, a multidisciplinary team of experienced researchers is assembled. The team always looks into the overall process, from upstream to downstream, as well as process costs. We come up with a first sketch, on the basis of which simulations are conducted to fine-tune the design. Then, we start building test installations, first on a small scale and then take the lessons learned to the bigger scale. So this is one of our biggest setups that we have designed and constructed in-house for CO2 and CO electrolysis. Uh, it is a very flexible setup where we can operate different types of reactors and different configurations. But its uniqueness lies in the fact that we can operate gas diffusion electrodes with, at high temperatures and high pressures thanks to this sophisticated uh, pressure control system, which allows us to increase the performance and stability of the reactions. And we are now designing a bigger setup where we can integrate the upstream CO2 capture part with the CO2 electrolysis in one single step. The lab at TNO in Delft is employed in the Voltachem program. We team up with partners and clients from all over the world in developing electrosynthesis routes to accelerate industrial electrification. Would you like to find out how we can support you in developing electrosynthesis routes? Then contact us via voltachem.com. All right, Anka, you use these facilities for some projects that are actually related to the topic of today. Indeed. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yes. So if, if, if I have to choose uh, in, in one way to say what we are concentrating on, it's I would say it's electrochemical process intensification. So. Um, what we are uh, we are trying to um, to make the process as uh, as economically feasible as possible and as um, um, as efficient as possible, and to use the tools that we have at our disposals. Um, uh, we are looking at concepts such as uh, integrating the the CO2 capture with electrochemical conversion. 
uh, or uh, uh, looking at paired reactions, um, looking at uh, how to separate the product in situ into the, into the electrolyzer. Um, and to do this, uh, we have to solve the relevant problems. So mm -hmm. you, the installations that you saw there are not the installations that use this type of uh, miniature no, cell. No. <laughs> uh, the cells that, that my colleagues are working on now are already at a larger scale. Because um, uh, this, this scaling up and this taking this step further, it's, it's not a trivial thing to do. Uh, it involves uh, all sorts of uh, technical challenges um, that, that have to be addressed at that scale. Um, and so these facilities help you to scale? Indeed, indeed. So yeah. um, and, uh, we are um, uh, indeed to scale it up and to operate it under, let's say, relevant conditions. So at, at uh, higher uh, temperatures, at higher pressures, which you would expect, let's say, if you would make a real plant, you would expect to operate also at higher pressures or higher temperatures. So already in the laboratory, we are asking these questions of how, how is... Uh, yeah these things they are necessary for the long-term business case as well i guess right indeed yeah and indeed. i think that's a beautiful link to our final topic of today because we're going to talk about the high volume products applications on the long-term business case <laughs> Moritz, that's especially where you are coming in, of course. First of all, wha why is Total Energies actually interested in these CO2 conversion technologies? Total Energy's ambition is to become uh, net zero 2050 together with society for all our pro production and also the products which are used by our um, customers. And we prepared a little video already for you to show you a little bit more about this uh, electrochemical CO2 conversion we're working on. Cool, let's have a look at the video. In this context, Total Energies explores an emerging new generation of sustainable chemicals and aviation fuels known as e-chemicals and e-fuels. Produced via CO2 capture and utilization using low carbon electricity from wind and solar and CO2 extracted from biomass, the atmosphere or industrial sources. Among CO2 capture and utilization technologies, CO2 electroconversion is a promising technology to produce e-ethylene for sustainable polyethylene production and e-jet for fueling airplanes. The heart of the technology is the electrolyzer, in which water is split at the anode producing protons and electrons, which are transported to the cathode where they react with CO2 to form ethylene with help of a catalyst. The energy for this transformation is provided by sustainable electricity. The ethylene is purified and further converted to sustainable polyethylene or e-jet. Total Energies develops and evaluates the potential of CO2 electroconversion to ethylene together with a strong network of academic and industrial partners, exploring innovative catalysts, electrolyzer designs and industrial integration. This project supports Total Energy's ambition to be a world-class player in the energy transition, committed to energy that is ever more affordable, clean, reliable, and accessible to as many people as possible. Martijn, I, I can imagine that you as Foldercam have many questions to the technique that Total Energy is, of course, developing right now. Uh, actually, we work together, huh? <laughs> so we know a lot. Uh, you know a lot uh, already, uh, but yeah. I, I'm sure that related to this topic, you have some more questions. No, yeah, I, I, exactly. I, I think one of the challenges is, of course, the timeline, and and that's uh, that's what uh, what you, of course, look at if you look at uh, ethylene and uh, and jet fuel. It's a longer term timeline that uh, that you are addressing. So I think making choices in the technologies and doing the things uh, uh, that are necessary in the right time is quite important. Uh, Right, uh, how do you see that, mm. Moritz? Yeah, this is exactly right. So uh, Total is, of course, not only looking at uh, electrochemical CO2 utilization, but at the whole, uh, at the all the different technologies which can bring us there. And uh, for Total, it is important to, to do an evaluation, to do an assessment, because when we want to scale this up to the scale which is needed to produce such commodity chemicals, this is going to take 
20, 20, 30 years. So we have to now start making the right choices, working with the right partners, because it's also something, it's a new, this, this um, sector coupling, so electricity mm -hmm. sector coupling with the a, with a, uh, process industry is new, and we have to look for the and find the right partners today. And, but we've been talking about the short-term business cases mm -hmm. today as well. Do you also have like short-term business cases or how do they relate to each other to these long-term cases? You uh, know? At Total Energies, we have a look at these and I think, as I said before, they're necessary in fact to develop the technology which can then be used, it's going to be very similar technology, for these uh, large volume business cases. And if we look at a little bit more broader, what, what conditions have to be met actually to make these technologies more viable at, at a larger scale? Yes, and I think we not only have technology, uh, tec technological uh, performance targets, but we also have um, surrounding conditions which have to be met. Mm -hmm. And this is, for example, es especially for the, uh, this is more true for the, for the commodity chemicals mm -hmm. and for the fine chemicals. For example, we need um, a large amount of green and cheap electricity and for CO2 electro conversion we also need uh, a large amount of CO2 which is somehow sustainable and then we have questions which, which is the CO2 source, is it an industrial source, yeah. does it have to be bio-based uh, or do we use uh, direct air capture? Anka, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, exactly, so, so this is Yes, th this is how, how things are going to change on, on the long term, is that our source of CO2 is going to change. Yeah. So the way we are solving the, the, the problems also, the technology side is going to change. So we have to stay ahead of with uh, and, and in line with the questions that are going to appear. Uh, right now we have a lot of CO2 coming from fossil sources. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be the future? Are we still going to have that? Or do we have to already think of, of making processes that capture CO2 from air or we use CO2 from biogenic sources? And um, there is no easy answer to this. And I think uh, Martin already said it earlier, it's you have to work on a portfolio of solutions and uh, one with a, uh, some with, with a short uh, horizon and others with a long horizon. Um, and there are, there are commonalities in this. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not completely different, but um, um, yeah, we have to stay, stay sharp and flexible and ask these questions ourselves all, all the time, yes. I totally agree. Yeah, maybe, maybe to add to that, uh, so I think it's also a matter of risk management. Huh? So if you start investing in technologies, whatever technology it is, you want to know what the risk is uh, if you start investing a lot. Huh? And I think, well, Total Energies also has to make choices along the way. And I think, especially to the longer term, huh, uh, uh, societal d demand is, mm -hmm. is changing. It's difficult to predict the future of uh, how many people will fly an airplane or how much pl plastics will be used in the future in this new world. Energy uh, sourcing, uh, where will the, the renewable energy come from or what is the carbon footprint of the electrons that come into this kind of technology, but also the carbon source. And if you, if you treat such a system as a very simple system where CO2 comes in, electricity comes in and a nice product come out, on all three directions there is certain uncertainties mm -hmm. and, 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 and yeah then is the question how to how do you deal with that uh, because it might be that that it's a very interesting technology that w should be quickly scaled up so maybe that's also also, also a question to, to Moritz like, like how, how do you deal with this so with the mm -hmm. with the with this uncertainty so to say in the future I think this, the solution, at least for Total Energy, is, uh, is, is doing is to really look at these, all these different technologies and to uh, start also developing these different technologies and to staying, st staying in the game. I think now we're not yet at the point where we can uh, discard some technologies and say, no, we think this mm -hmm. is not going to happen. So um, plastic recycling, for example, then also bio-based fuels, for example, this, these are important uh, technologies which are going to play a role in the future. And I think we have, at the moment, our soci as a society and as a company, we have to uh, keep our all the doors open yeah, because it can always change. Some, like especially in, in, in the uh, CO2 utilization sector, I have the impression every 
few months we talk to a new partner because it's a completely new ecosystem we're building and then we th they say oh no you cannot do it like this or like this you have to take this into consideration and then we're also adapting our our vision and our uh, the pathway we want to take. You need to stay flexible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look at another example of a NOSC eFuel in this case. Carl Hauptmeier who's managing director of NOSC eFuel and he has an example of technology for high volume production. Hello. My name is Karl Hauptmeier and I'm the Managing Director of Norske Fuel. Most of you will not have heard about Norske Fuel, so please let me explain. Norske Fuel is a Norwegian-based project developer aiming at realizing large-scale industrial power to liquid projects to produce renewable synthetic fuel for the aviation industry and other hard to electrify sectors. How is this done? Utilizing electrolysis and renewable energy, CO2 and water are reduced to a mix of hydrogen and carbon monoxide the so-called syngas. These building blocks are then converted to hydrocarbons by utilizing the Fischer-Tropsch synthesis process. The resulting synthetically and renewably produced hydrocarbons are very similar in their properties to fossil oil derived products and fuels. Thus, wide scale application in multiple sectors currently dependent on fossil feedstock and which are otherwise hard to decarbonize or electrify is made possible. A good example being the aviation industry where planes are dependent on energy carriers with a high energy density. Now, what are the challenges? Power to liquid projects are rather complex, requiring expertise from many different areas. This is why the shareholders of North Ski Fuel decided to join forces to bring in their expertise from various different angles. But apart from project management, it is also technological innovation which makes power to liquid possible and economically viable. Two game-changing technologies are of specific interest. First, the direct air capture of CO2, which will allow power to liquids to be produced anywhere in the world, independent from industrial point sources of CO2. Second, the solid oxide electrolysis. Through the ability to electrochemically reduce not only water but also CO2, the solid oxide electrolysis technology allows for a very efficient production of syngas, thus dramatically increasing the conversion efficiency of the overall power to liquid process overall resulting in 30% more fuel output for the same energy input. Both technologies are available and have been demonstrated. However, regardless of the advantages, both technologies require further validation before investors will have generated enough trust to enable large-scale deployment. And this is the key challenge, how to achieve the scale necessary to drive down the cost of the product. We at North Ski Fuel have chosen a staged approach starting with what we would call an industrial demonstrator, subsequently scaling to full commercial production. We believe it is the right time to bring the technology into the field. If we do not do it now, Europe will have lost its chance of positioning itself at the forefront of a technical revolution. Moritz, yes. what can we learn from the story of Carl? I think uh, it's the right approach. I think it's very important to um, to have these pilot plans, to have these demonstrator plans uh, to showcase the technology because as also what uh, David Dave Sinton already mm -hmm. said before, with this scaling up you identify new challenges which you need to address and therefore I think this is the right way. This is of course, we also look at, uh, at this pathway which was described. There are also other pathways we're looking at and uh, this is I think very good, a very good uh, um, project. Good. He also prepared a poll to us and to the people at home, let's go to the poll, let's have a look. Here it is, when's the right time to invest in developing and industrializing technology? I would say always, right? It's always good to invest. <laughs> <laughs> is it the first principle is shown and developments need to be started, the concept is proven and the first pilot needs to be deployed. Pilot trials have been run and now a pre-commercial demonstration is needed and all after the first demonstration project when the technology is proven in practice or other always an option. Martijn, what would you say? Yeah, it's, it's a right difficult time. question huh? because it de de depends. Uh, the every phase in the development trajectory of a, of, of a technology has its own costs and risk profile. Yeah. Uh, so maybe in the beginning the costs are not that high, but it's very high, high, high risk. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, at the end, uh, the, the costs are uh, really high. And maybe the technology risk is low, but the market risk is still high. So I think dependent on this phase, there's different type of investors yeah. and different types of 
funding mechanisms to make the next step. And I think what, what, what is really nice about, uh, about Norsk EFU is that they have the approach that they set up this company now together, which also enables to make a next step. And, uh, uh, but it is a challenge. Huh? There are so many different types of funding schemes and mechanisms uh, to get technologies further mm -hmm. that you really have to think and, and many times have to make a patchwork of, uh, of me of, uh, to make next steps. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe just to add, uh, not to what Martin was saying, but it's good to, to realize that what we have talked about now, it's, it's a lot of the low temperature electrolysis of CO2. But there is also the, this, uh, you know, uh, rather advanced technology of um, the high temperature ele um, uh, electrolysis of CO2. It's called uh, solid oxide uh, electrolysis. Uh, which is able to produce syn gas uh, at high temperatures and can be compatible already with other downstream processes. It will have other challenges, but it will also create other opportunities. So it's it's good to keep uh, to to keep in mind of, of all these options and um, um, uh, and Voltachem it's it's also looking at at all these different options at this, the low temperature electrolysis at high temperature electrolysis and trying to find value chains on on both these directions. Um, um, put the puzzle pieces together for what is the most... Uh, there are so many puzzle pieces. When I listen to you, then I think like, wow, there's so many things that you can choose from. How do you make the right choice? Yeah, uh, that's when we have to, to talk with, uh, with, with parties like Total, that, uh, that they help us to ask the right questions and they tell us what their problems are, or with um, equipment providers or with licensors. And uh, if you understand what their needs are and what their business is, they are going to be the ones that make money in the future with this. So it's about the ecosystem working together, collaborating, indeed, indeed. asking the right questions. What question would you ask them right now? What's I the right I question? I wanted to just uh, <laughs> to, 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 to uh, come back to the wha yeah. what you said, to bounce back on this. Um, and because I think this is completely right, because um, before the chemical industry, la last century we built up, society built up the chemical industry as it is today. And this, uh, this century we have to make it green, we have to make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. And we have to connect um, stakeholders which before were not connected. Um, for example, the w with electrical uh, energy providers, etc. Um, and this is very important to do this. So you asked the question, or the question was asked before, when is the right time to develop and to invest? And I think, uh, because this is all new, we have to start very early to be involved, in fact. And all the different stakeholders have to, be sta have to start to be involved. And um, uh, platforms like VoltaChem enable, in fact, this uh, involvement, bring people together, which were not uh, historically uh, working together. And therefore, I think this is, uh, this is very important and very good that we have this platform today. Good, and that we're joining us together right now. And that's why it's so important that we also have some room for the questions that are asked by our people at home watching. Let's have a look. Here we have it. We are constantly talking about certain kind of molecules that would be great to start deploying this type of technologies. But what defines a molecule to be more suitable or economically viable for electrochemical reduction of COT, CO2? Moritz. Um, you have the fine chemicals where you have a very uh, high margin or you have a high price per ton of product. This is, for example, what Avancium is working on. Mm -hmm. Then companies like Total Energies work on uh, commodity chemicals where the uh, margin is smaller you, you and yeah, they're cheaper, cheaper products. So um, generally, using not a lot of electrons for making the products while keeping the weight high, so keeping the oxygen in, mm -hmm. gives you a product uh, which, is to which could compete already today, which where you could see um, um, business cases like, for example, formic acid or this carboxylic acid. And then, as also uh, Erica said before, if you want to go to ethylene, you have to put in a lot of electrons. You lose a lot of weight yep. of the oxygen. Therefore, this is more in the long term. Yeah. And mm -hmm. yeah. That's the answer we all agree on? Good, yeah. okay, let's do one more question. Let's have a look. How do you deal with the risk of developing a temporary transition method, which is likely to be replaced by direct mm -hmm. bio-based chemistry and the make industry from biogene, hydrogen, and carbon out of second generation bio feedstock? Thanks, Peter, for your question. Who should we ask this question to, Martijn? Who knows the answer? Yeah, yeah so maybe as a general remark, it is, of course, a tough 
thing, huh? to make choices in which molecule to work on. We already always have this discussion also uh, with our partners, mm -hmm. in the labs, etc. because there is not a silver bullet and you cannot predict the future. So if you talk about I where is a business case, well, if you look at the current market, ethylene is a, a, a large market uh, with a certain uh, a profit margin, so you can make uh, some money out of that. But also the high value is a is an import, uh, important market, as was just mentioned, uh, higher margin, uh, but lower volume. So which ones to specifically choose is very difficult. If you look at the second question now, how will the future look like? Huh? Will, will still ethylene be a dominant mm -hmm. uh, platform uh, molecule towards our plastics? Or will there be more oxygenated uh, bio-based plastics or maybe CO2 based plastics which also contain oxygen. We don't know. Uh, so I think that's a trajectory that we have to follow. That's why we have to, to have these several approaches in parallel and dependent on the, the, the status in, in, in one year, in five years, in ten years, we will see certain partners and or companies from the market take up a certain direction and outcomes the new uh, situation. It's, it's not a predetermined economy no. uh, it's 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 continuously developing itself but for sure i think myself i think that uh, a bio-based routes and and oxygen uh, containing products are important because what was just said if you uh, produce ethylene for example from co2 you also get a lot of oxygen out so what do you do with that uh, so somehow we have to find also in the novel chemistry and the novel polymer products mm -hmm. a way to utilize more those those oxygen uh, uh, that oxygen from either electrolysis for for hydrogen or for for example CO2 electrolysis. All right, I think enough has been said on this topic of high volume products and applications for a long term business case. We're gonna round up this session, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when we have a look back, we got to know our guests. I think we succeeded by getting to know Moritz, Anka and uh, Erika, of course. Thank you for joining us, but you're not going to leave without some final remarks. I'm really looking forward to learn from you guys what you guys take away from today's session. Anka, can I start with you? Yes, well, it was a, a, a nice session to see uh, uh, to see all these different parties together, right? Like uh, our industrial partners, the the, uh, the professors that are doing the uh, the nice uh, research, and what what I realize um, is that uh, one aspect is to to work together, um, but also to be uh, to be aware of each other's uh, of each other's challenges and of each other's points of view, um, and. Uh, um, uh, yeah, and, and we at Voltac and we, we, we place it, we place ourselves, let's say, in the middle of this ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, between uh, universities and companies and, and other research institutes, and we're trying to look uh, for, for solutions to, uh, to address this. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the session today was, was a, you know, just a, a good example of, of, um, of the How discussions that we, are, uh, that we are typically having, yes. Cool. Moritz, what do you take away? That we cannot do it alone. Not one company or one organization can do it alone. We have to do it together and we want to do it fast because if we do it classically, it's going to take too long to address uh, the, the, the climate change. So platforms like VoltaCam and these interactions we have is very important. And what I would also like to, our, uh, to the people listening to us, so if you think you could add something to, to, to these programs, to the projects we have, for example, membrane or uh, gas diffusion electrode or pr providers of electrolyzers, talk to us. Let's see if we can work together to accelerating the development of uh, these technologies. Good. Let's go to Erika. Erika, what do you take? Home. You are already home. What, what do you take away then? I am home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I agree that collaboration is super important, but I also think collaboration with uh, pioneering, yeah, let's say pioneering parties or companies is super important. So um, I think at this table we have a couple of these pioneers, and I think it's these parties that kind of uh, stick out their neck that are pushing something forward just because they know that it is the right thing and it requires creativity and flexibility but I think having uh, um, 
the parties to develop the technology, to push it forward, to give the right market pool um, is, is, is the most important thing. Good. Last but not least, Martijn. Yeah, what I totally agree. I really like the discussion and, yeah. and uh, it's always good to, to continue discussing because as I said, there's not one direction or one silver bullet. I think if we talk in half a year or a year, it will have changed again. Uh, so we can do this session of course, next year uh, once more. <laughs> but, but, but what I try to say is we have to have that discussion together. So I really like uh, also what, uh, what Moritz was saying. So if people uh, want to discuss these kind of topics with us, uh, with with us, with the partners, etc. We're really open because uh, things will, will change, that's for sure. And the question is what role will different organizations or companies take in that change? Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us at the table, Martijn, Moritz, uh, and of course Erika online as, uh, as well, and Anka here as well. Um, thank you for watching us today and for joining this session and for all the inputs you gave to us. And um, next time we're going to talk about the next gen water electrolysis, cost effective hydrogen production enabled by high tech innovations. Um, it's uh, at the end of September and we're going live from Johnson Matthew in the UK. And you can sign up right now at the Voltechem website. I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon, or for Professor Sinton, of course, a very pleasant morning. Take care. Bye bye.